Unemployment. To better understand unemployment, we need to look at some labor force statistics. Generally, these labor force statistics are produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, generally speaking, based on regular surveys of 60,000 households, and based on the quote-unquote adult population, which is folks that are 16 years or older. The BLS divides the population into three groups. The employed, the unemployed, and those not in the labor force. The employed are paid employees. They could be self-employed or unpaid workers in a family business as well. So paid employees, the self-employed, and unpaid workers in a family business. Uh, I grew up on a farm and certainly worked um, after I was 16 as an unpaid worker in the family business on the family farm. There are the unemployed, um, people not working, who have looked for work within the previous four weeks. So within the previous month, they've been looking for a job, but they're unemployed. They can't find one. And then there's those that are not in the labor force. That's everyone else. That's everyone else that's left over. The labor force is the total number of workers, including the employed and the unemployed. The labor force, I should point out, does not include those who are not looking for a job. So those that are not in the labor force are not counted in uh, as a part of the labor force. Now, the unemployment rate and the labor force participation are two very simple calculations we make. The unemployment rate, sometimes called the U-rate, more times than not just called simply the unemployment rate, is the percent of the labor force, again, those looking for a job, that are that is unemployed. Okay, so the unemployment rate equals the number of unemployed over the total number in the labor force, and we multiply that by 100 to get a whole, um, a whole uh, percentage number instead of getting, say, 0.08064, um, we can get 8.06 as, as an answer. So that's what we multiply by 100. So if you got, you know, 5% unemployment, um, you'd, instead of expressing that as 0 0.05, you'd want to ex express it by 5, so 5%. That's why you multiply it by 100. Now, the labor force participation rate is the percent of a, the adult population that is in the labor force. So those 16 and over that are... Um, actively looking for jobs and perhaps don't have them or actually uh, actively working a job. So um, again, the labor force are those that are employed and those that are unemployed but looking for work. So labor force participation rate is the percent of the adult population that is in the labor force. So again, the labor force divided by the total adult population over the age of 16, again, multiplied by 100 for percentage terms. So many of the following slides abbreviate unemployment rate as the U-rate to reduce slide clutter. So just keep that in mind. We're going to call unemployment rate uh, the U-rate. Um, you'll hear me verbally say it, but if you see it on a slide, I don't want you to get confused. And um, you can use it in your notes to reduce your burden as you're taking notes as we go along. So let's take an active learning activity here and let's calculate labor force statistics. Let's compute the labor force, the unemployment rate, the adult population, and the labor force participation rate using the following data. There's adult, adult population in the U.S. by group as of September 2013. There are 144.3 million employed uh, workers. There are 11.3 million unemployed workers. And 90.6 million folks are not in the labor force. This exercise gives you an immediate uh, reinforcement and application of the concepts on the previous slide. So if you need to rewind a little bit and see again how you calculate that, that's fine. Uh, it should prepare you for some of the kinds of questions you're going to see on your exam. And it also gives you a sense of the actual magnitude of these statistics in the U.S. in recent years. So um, again, most this data is coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So let's take a look. Well, here are your answers. Um, to, to get labor force, you simply add the employed plus the unemployed, and you get 144.3 plus 11.3, and you get 155.6. So you have 155.6 million, 155 million workers in the labor force. That's the employed plus the unemployed. doesn't include the folks who don't want to work. The unemployment rate is simply the number of unemployed divided by the labor force multiplied by 100 for a percentage term. So you can get a whole percentage term here. 
There are 11.3 million workers unemployed, and there's 155.6 total uh, number of workers in the um, labor force. Um, you would get 0 0.073 if you didn't multiply by 100. So if you multiply by 100, um, you get 7.3%. So um, you could get slight differences due to rounding errors, but um, in this example, uh, the unemployed divided by labor force times 100 is 7.3 percent. So population, what's our population? Well, that's our labor force, which is the employed and the unemployed, plus the folks that are not in the labor force. So your labor force plus those not in the labor force, that's 155.6 plus 90.6. You get 246.2 million people, adult people, again, adults, 16 and up in the um, population. Now, the labor force participation rate, it's abbreviated here, it's the labor force participation rate, is simply your labor force over your total population um, to, uh, times 100. So you have that labor force of 155.6 over that total population from up here, 246.2. Multiplied by 100, you get 63.2%. It's as simple as that. Now, looking at labor force statistics from different groups, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, publishes these uh, statistics for demographic groups within the population. So you can look at labor force participation, unemployment, and so on and so forth across many different demographics. These data reveal uh, widely different labor market experiences for different groups. So let's take a look. Um, you can break people down by, say, white and black. You can break them down by male and female. And you can see the unemployment rates by different demographics. Um, when it, within each, uh, either racial group, males have a higher per, uh, participation rate than females. Blacks have a far higher unemployment rate than whites. This is a great concern to many economists and policymakers when we talk about issues of racial harmony and equity. Um, this is concerning. So uh, this is as recent, as, yeah, it's September 2013. So I mean, these aren't old figures. So we're looking at adults in these statistics of 20 years and older. Now, generally, BLS would be 16 and up. So um, we see white males have a higher uh, participation rate than females. Black males um, higher participation rate in, in the workforce uh, than black females. Um, and then we look at unemployment rates across uh, across not only male and female, but also demographic. And we see an alarming trend here where black males and females have a higher rate of unemployment. Now, um, as one would expect, teens have lower participation rates and higher unemployment rates than adults. What is striking, so this is this this stats here, what they did is they did 20 and up, and then they looked at teenage workers, like your, your folks working uh, while they're in high school, that type of thing. Um, Teens have lower participation rates and higher unemployment rates than adults. What is striking, though, are that are racial disparities. The proportion of white teens in their labor force getting uh, thus getting skills and experience that will help them later as adult job market participants is far higher than black teen participation, and the unemployment rate for black teens is far higher than for white teens. So again, the the trend of of equity concerns continue. Now. Uh, compared to the national average, the unemployment is higher for Hispanics and lower for Asians. The participation rates of these groups are similar to those of the national average. But you should know that Asian is the only demographic group which, for which seasonally adjusted data was not available in this, in this data set. So figures for all the other groups are seasonally adjusted. Um, uh, by seasonal adjustment means like a lot of teenagers could get or well, a lot of people in general could get a lot more jobs around, say, the holidays when, when stores are looking to hire more people, um, when UPS is looking to hire more people to help with the increased volume of packages around Christmas. Um, so that, that would be an example of adjusting for seasonal, uh, seasonal adjustments. So um, some employment's cyclical, so there can be uh, times where it, where it swings up and times where it swings down. What this data is trying to do is control for that. But it's just interesting that you can take the Bureau of Labor Statistics and look at it from male, female, black, white, um, Asian, Hispanic, and, and, and take a look and see if there's some disparities between, the, between groups. Now, um, these statistics, which are not in the textbook, are particularly interesting probably to college students. 
Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that educational attainment is positively related to the to labor force participation. For most people, the prospect of better jobs is a key reason for investing in education. So go to school and get a better job, right? Now, you may be especially happy to learn that by getting um, your degree. Uh, in this example, we're using here as a bachelor's degree. Um, you reduce your chances of becoming unemployed by more than half. So compared to people with only just a high school diploma, and by about um, half the people compared that won't finish college, by getting a bachelor's degree, your chance of unemployment rate um, really goes down. As you can see, the more education you get here, the unemployment rate goes down, and your labor force participation rate goes up. Basically means you're more marketable. You, you have more discernible skills in the market. Even in a tough market, people want to hire you. So that's a good thing. Now, here's an interesting thing. Looking at labor force participation rates by sex from 1950 to 2012. Now, think about the stereotypes that have changed in terms of women workers in the market from 1950 to more recent times. The male um, uh, labor force participation rate um, is, is in a percentage of all males. Similarly, the same thing with females. Now, the vertical axis starts at 20 rather than zero to make the trends more apparent. Um, it's just easier to see the lines in this scale. Uh, since 1950, the female participation has nearly doubled from 34% up to 60%, and male participation rate has declined from 86% to 73%. So what are the factors do you think can have caused these trends? The textbook takes a look at some explanations in the case study entitled Labor Force Participation of Men and Women in the U.S. Economy. What are some of the effects and consequences of these trends? Well, that's, that's the same thing you'll see in the text. Well, we know from 1950 to more present day, there would be an upward trend in female participation in the market because, well, the roles of, of females in society have changed. They've been um, far seen far more equally in the, uh, the 2000s than they were in the 1950s. So there's been an upward trend in the market. Um, also, the male trend is pretty flat. There is a, a slight negative here from 86% to 73%. Perhaps more males are finding out it's okay to stay home with kids. Um, plus, you have females coming into the market taking more jobs, so it would make sense that perhaps males were taking less jobs. So they have to come from somewhere. Now, there has been job growth over this time to supplicate both of them. However, when there's such an astronomical increase in females, perhaps there's a slight increase in males, and that would make sense. Now, take a look at our second active learning activity. There's limitations to the unemployment rate. In each of the following, what happens to the unemployment rate? Does the unemployment rate give an accurate impression of what's happening in the labor market? So let's take a look at three scenarios. The first one's part A. Sue lost her job and begins looking for a new one. Okay. Scenario B. John, a steel worker who has been out of work since his meal closed last year, becomes discouraged and gives up looking for work. He's a discouraged worker. And then example C, Sam, the solo or, or the sole earner in his family of five, just lost his $80,000 job as a research scientist. Immediately, he takes a part-time job at McDonald's until he can find another job in his field. The objective of this exercise is to lead you to discover why the unemployment rate is not a perfect in indicator of joblessness. There's a lot of things going on here. Uh, so let's take a look. Here's the first set of our answers on part A. Sue lost her job but begins looking for a new one. This is clear that unemployment rate would rise. She's someone who wants to work, okay, and she doesn't have a job, but she wants one. So she is definitely unemployed. A rising unemployment rate gives the impression that the labor market is worsening, and it is. When Sue lost her job, it's worsening. Now, let's look at B. John has been out of work since last year. He becomes discouraged and stops looking for work. Well, this is the, introduces the term discouraged workers. Discouraged workers would like to work, but have given up looking for jobs. They're not actively seeking jobs. They're just discouraged. This is classified technically as not in the labor force rather than unemployed. The unemployment rate falls because John is no longer counted as unemployed. So he's dropped out of the labor force. He's no longer in those uh, first two groups of employed versus unemployed. So the unemployment rate actually goes down. A falling unemployment rate gives the impression that the labor market is improving. However, it's not. John didn't leave on his own. He left because he was discouraged. Let's look at the third example, Sam, Part C. Sam lost his $80,000 a year job and takes a part-time job at McDonald's until he finds a better one. 
the unemployment rate changed because the person, or, or excuse me, the unemployment rate is unchanged because a person is quote unquote employed whether they were full time or part time. They're in the labor force and they have a job. However, things are much worse for Sam. He wasn't. He had an eighty thousand dollar job. Now he's working part time at McDonald's. So the unemployment rate fails to show what's really going on here. So there's some limitations. Now, what does the unemployment rate really measure? The unemployment rate is not a perfect indicator of joblessness or the health of a labor market. It excludes discouraged workers, like the steel worker we were talking about, and it does not distinguish between full and part-time work, think of Sam, or people working part-time because full-time jobs are not available, i.e. at McDonald's. Some people misreport their work status to the ba um, Bureau of Labor Statistics survey as well. Those 60,000 households, some people, well, they lie. Perhaps they're embarrassed, perhaps they don't want to tell the truth. Despite these issues, the unemployment rate is still a very useful barometer of the labor market and economy. Okay, it can give you an indication of where things are heading. Now, the duration of unemployment. Most spells of unemployment are short. Okay, typically one third of the unemployed have been unemployed for under five weeks. Two thirds have been unemployed for under 14 weeks and only 20% have been unemployed for over six months. Okay, so as the unemployment stretches out, less and less people are generally unemployed. So it's more of a short-term issue. Yet most observed unemployment is long-term, okay? Most observed unemployment is long-term. There's a small group of long-term unemployed persons that has, a fair, that has fairly little turnover, so it accounts for most of the unemployment observed over time, okay? Now, the data under the first bullet point came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, via the Employment Situation Survey. Now, some of you may think the two facts on this slide contradict each other. The book gives a simple example that helps you understand how these facts can both be true. These facts imply that economists and policymakers must be careful by interpreting data on unemployment and designing policies to help the unemployed. Okay? While most spells of unemployment are short, Typically, one-third of the unemployed or, or have only lost their jobs within the last five weeks, so within a month or so, okay? And then really only 20% of them are still unemployed within six months. Yet, the quote-unquote observed unemployment is long-term. So, uh, knowing these facts help policymakers design better policies to help the unemployed. So, for the most part, if you become unemployed, it's typically a short-run problem, yet the unemployment rate likes to look at it in terms of long term because we do these surveys every now and then it makes un unemployment seem a little bit longer okay now there's a couple reasons behind this well first one is cyclical unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment so we look at them compared here there's always some unemployment that's what makes it look long term though the unemployment rate itself fluctuates from year to year now the natural rate of unemployment is the normal rate of unemployment around which the actual unemployment rate fluctuates. That's a little more confusing than it needs to be. What you need to know is when the job market is in equilibrium, okay, the folks that are left over that still want a job, okay, that is the natural rate of unemployment. Just remember it that way. Now cyclical unemployment is the deviation of the unemployment from its natural rate, okay. Unemployment, if you can think about um, the natural, uh, unemployment would have a lot of variation, up and down, up and down, up and down, okay? Natural rate of unemployment is pretty consistent, pretty much a straight line, so it doesn't bounce up and down, all right? The cyclical unemployment is the deviation from the natural rate of unemployment, okay? So imagine, if you would, a graph that had an axis right here that would be the percent of people unemployed and then had an axis running across horizontally would be time. You would see a curve uh, of unemployment that did just like my cursor is doing here up and down up and down natural rate of unemployment would be people that are just coming and going transitioning in and out of the labor force okay it would be pretty flat well these you put the two together the flat natural rate of unemployment and then the unemployment rate okay as these ziggly lines we're going to show it on the next slide the deviations from the natural rate of unemployment up to the cyclical increases in unemployment is cyclical unemployment. It's the deviation from 
of unemployment from its natural rate, and it's associated with business cycles, which we'll study late in, in later chapters. So there's some ups and downs in the market. So unemployment, the bottom line is unemployment is a serious and complicated problem for a variety of reasons. To most effectively address each problem, we need to break down and look at each cause separately. So we're going to begin by noting that the causes of short-run fluctuations in unemployment are different from the causes of long-run average unemployment rate, which is called the natural rate of unemployment. So in the long run, the job market's in, in equilibrium, and the folks still looking for a job at that point is what's known as the natural rate of unemployment. So let's take a look at the next slide, which looks at U.S. data on both from 1960. So here we go. See this more steady line, this blue line here? That's your natural rate of unemployment. See your unemployment rate? Boom, boom, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. These deviations, say between this point with my cursor up to this point, that's cyclical unemployment. From this point down to there, that's cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment, the up and down, the deviations from the blue line to the red line. Huge deviation right here, okay? That's cyclical unemployment right? from here to here. Right. Cyclical unemployment is the gap between the two lines, and in, in recessions, the actual unemployment rate is higher than the natural rate. The cyclical unemployment is positive. In booms, unemployment is below the natural rate, and cyclical unemployment is negative. So you, you obviously would prefer it to be negative, but we know it variates over time. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. So your deviations from, say, the blue line to the red, up to the red line is your cyclical unemployment. This would be a positive cyclical unemployment, and from this point to that point would be a neg negative cyclical unemployment. Now, let's explain the, the natural rate as an, in as an overview. So even when the economy is doing well, there's always some unemployment. These include frictional unemployment and structural unemployment. Frictional unemployment occurs when workers spend time searching for jobs that best suit their skills and tastes. Short term for most workers. So this is that thing we we're talking about. Most of this unemployment is short term. However, however, if you have a very specific skill set, like say you're a CPA or you have some sort of um, specific forensic accounting experience, it's going to take you some time to find the exact job you're going to want. So that's frictional unemployment. It occurs when workers spend time searching for jobs that best suit their skills and tastes. Now, structural unemployment occurs when there are fewer jobs than workers. And this is more usually long-term. This is a far more reaching uh, economic uh, problem when people want a job and can't find it. Okay. In later chapters, we'll study short-run economic fluctuations and learn more about the causes and possible cures of cyclical unemployment. But for the rest of this chapter, our job is understanding the various causes of natural, uh, the natural rate of unemployment. Now, um, let's get started. So let's talk about a job search. A job search, workers have uh, different tastes and skills and, and jobs have different requirements. A job search, as a term, is a process of matching workers with appropriate jobs. There can be sectoral shifts, or, which are changes in the composition of demand across industries and regions in a country. In a, in a country. Such shifts deplace some workers who must search for new jobs uh, appropriate for their skills and tastes. Sometimes they have to go get some more training. Perhaps it's their, their jobs no longer exist anymore. Now, the economy is always changing, so there's always some frictional unemployment. It's some frictional unemployment is in, inevitable. So there's always some shifts when we move away from being a manufacturing type of economy to being a service-based, knowledge-based economy. Sometimes jobs are lost, okay, and that would be a sectoral shift when they're lost due to the changes in what employers are looking for. Uh, they could be looking for, you know, they used to be looking for someone for the last four years that knew how to run this particular machine. Well, now they have a machine that runs itself. They're looking for somebody that knows how to fix that machine. So that could be a sectoral shift, and it can lead to a job search and unemployment. Now, taking a look at public policy and job searches, there are government agencies that provide information about job vacancies to speed up the matching of workers with jobs. You want people to be employed. If they're unemployed, they're typically on unemployment. They're dependent on the state. Uh, people without jobs, um, and they don't have ample uh, ample income over a long time, they could be suffering. They could perhaps turn to to more devious deeds like crime, which increases the crime rate and increases costs for society. So government employment agencies are a good thing that can provide um, quicker leads to job vacancies to get people in jobs more quickly. 
There's also public training programs to equip workers displace from um, displace, excuse me, from declining industries with skills they needed to grow, uh, needed in growing industries. So perhaps you worked in manufacturing and now uh, a BMW or a Chrysler or somebody comes in your area, you need training on how to um, how, how, how automobile you need training perhaps moving from textiles to the automobile industry and automobile manufacturing industry where you're going to uh, use sophisticated uh, computer systems to uh, maintain a robot that's building cars you need a whole new skill set so there are potentially public training programs um, i know of several programs like this that actually popped up in the charleston area immediately before and after in a, in a uh, perpetuated after boeing came to charleston um, that work with the local tech school to give workers skills uh, to be able to work at Boeing in the aviation industry. So uh, public training programs can, can equip workers that were in a declining industry, say textiles, and give them new skills that they could go into a growing industry in the area. Now, let's talk about unemployment insurance, abbreviated as UI. Unemployment insurance is insurance is a government program that partially protects workers' incomes when they become unemployed. Unemployment insurance increases the frictional unemployment, uh, which means it gives them a longer time to look for a job. Uh, that's frictional unemployment. And to see why, recall one of the ten principles of economics. People respond to incentives. So this is why it increases frictional unemployment. Unemployment benefits end, what, end when a worker takes a job. So some workers have less incentive to search or take jobs while eligible to receive benefits. Now the hope here is that they would be able to find a job that pays them more than the unemployment insurance. So as a policymaker, you have to be careful how much you give them for unemployment insurance. You might give them incentive never to look again if they're earning more money than they think they can get in the market. However, if you can buy them over, okay, it'll keep them from becoming discouraged. Um, it'll keep them from perhaps engaging in nefarious behavior to, to, to get what they want, i.e. stealing. Um, but if you give people unemployment insurance, it is a bridge from job to job. And then perhaps you also have um, a training program that helps them get qualified for a, for a job that's a better fit. So um, unemployment insurance can be a good thing, but at the same time you have the incentive. So if you're getting paid with for doing nothing, perhaps it attracts people to look for jobs less quickly, which increases frictional unemployment. Now the benefits of unemployment insurance is that it reduces uncertainty over incomes. Okay, that gives you that um, peace of mind that you're going to have at least something coming in. Okay, it's not going to replace your entire income you had coming in. It's going to be a fraction of it. But it gives the unemployed more time to search, resulting in better job matches and thus higher productivity. So it allows people to find their, their, their better job instead of just taking the next job. It allows them to find a job that they're really good at and they would enjoy being at for a long time so, or a longer time. So it's, it's a good thing in, in buying time there. Now, explaining the structural unemployment. Structural unemployment occurs when there's not enough jobs to go around. It occurs when the wage is kept above equilibrium. All right, there are three reasons for this. Uh, one of them, I think, would come right off. First, I want to talk about is minimum wage. So, uh, for whatever reason, uh, suppliers of, of of labor, that's the workers. Demanders of labor, that's the people looking to hire for jobs. These two crazy kids, supply and demand, get together, we have an equilibrium. But for some reason, let's say the government comes in and says, no, you can't pay that much. You're going to be at wage one here. That's the actual wage. Well, your quantity supplied is going to be over here. People are going to be willing to supply their labor. And your quantity demanded is going to be here. They're not intersecting at, these, at this wage. Okay, So you have quantity demanded. People are going to want to hire. Companies are going to hire this many workers. And uh, laborers are going to want to. This many laborers are going to want to work. Okay, This S, drop a line down. Here's your quantity. Well, when your quantity exceeds. Your quantity supplied, I should say, exceeds your quantity, your quantity demanded. You have a surplus. When we're talking about labor here, a surplus, it means there's more people that want jobs than have them. So you have unemployment. The difference between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded is unemployment. The first reason why this can occur is the minimum wage and minimum wage laws. A minimum wage may exceed the equilibrium wage for at least for the least skilled and un, or un, excuse me. Minimum wage may exceed the equilibrium wage for it, for the least skilled or experienced workers. So your people with the less skills and people with the less experience, um, 
would be priced out. They're gonna this is gonna cause structural unemployment because at a higher price, people want to buy less of anything. Okay. Well, in this case, the higher price is a higher wage, and the people buying are companies hiring workers. So at a higher price, they're gonna to want to hire less workers. So that creates structural unemployment. But this group is, is a small part of the labor force, so minimum wage can't explain most unemployment. Now, in the previous chapters, uh, just a reminder, EQ M here is equilibrium. So the textbooks um, has a great FYI box entitled Who Earns the Minimum Wage? And it summarizes a recent study by the Department of Labor detailing minimum wage earners. The problem is with minimum wage. If you go in and say it's currently $7.25, let's double it and pay everybody $15. The problem is then it causes an economic ripple. Okay? Think about this. $7.25, hey, my pay just got more than doubled up to $15. I'm happy. Yay. What if the guy that just was being paid $15, what does he want now? Huh, he wants $20 or $30, right? Well, what about the guy who was earning $25 before? He wants more too. Well, what happens over time? Well, it ripples out and out and out. And those who go on, who who had those higher higher wages, they want more. Okay, they're saying, "Well, I have more skills than someone who has minimum wage. Why are we being paid the same now?" Well, I have more skills than somebody who's being paid fifteen dollars. He's being thirty. Why am I being paid twenty five now? And it has this ripple effect, and it just increases. You end up with everybody earning more money, and you have inflation, and then prices just go up, and it's like you didn't get a raise at all. And then 10, 15 years down the line, we're talking about, hey, man, $15 is not enough to live on. We need, we need 20 okay? And then we just repeat the process. It's not very hard to, to understand that minimum wage has that ripple effect. Now, the second uh, reason we're talking about here uh, for structural unemployment are unions. Uh, a union is a worker association that bargered, uh, bar ah, if I could speak, that bargains with employers over wages, benefits, and working conditions. Unions exert market power to negotiate higher wages for workers. Here's what you need to know about unions. It's a monopoly. It's labor that's pooled as one unit and sold as one unit. It's a monopoly on labor. Everyone that works gets together and negotiates as one. That creates market power in negotiations. And the typical union worker earns 20% higher wages and gets more benefits than a non-union worker in the same type of work. Now, information about union wage uh, premiums differ. The textbooks say that union wages are about 10 to 20% higher. Other sources... Um, like the New York Times article have, have, uh, that's featured in the, in the news box in your textbook, say the figure is closer to 20%. So there's a little variation there. Up to 20% is what we'll use. Not including the increased benefits that union workers enjoy. Okay, So uh, New York Times says, hey, the pay is going to be about 20% higher, and that's before they get all the, the benefits they negotiated. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that in 2004, the median weekly earnings of full-time employed workers were about 781 for union workers and 612 for non-union workers, a difference of 28%. So it is significant. So the range of estimates seems to be between 20 or 10 to 30%. Uh, in this book, we pick the book picks up 20% as a nice round number in the middle of this range. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we'll just roll with that. But what you really need to know about union is it's a monopoly on labor. You know, unions have done a lot of good things over time, um, ended uh, a lot of discrimination, and then also um, enacted a lot of child uh, labor laws, which was all obviously awesome. It's protected um, workers' rights and in, in not to work in a polluted factory or someplace where they're getting poisoned or very dangerous. So they made they made the the manufacturing, in particular, in this country, much more. Um, uh, much more safe for workers. At the same time, their monopoly on labor, and they kind of push the markets around. And when the cost of labor go up, okay, unions are saying, "Well, you have to hire everybody." Well, what are they going to do? They're going to pass that higher cost onto um, onto consumers in the form of higher prices. Okay, that's just how that works. Um, so uh, that is one reason why structural unemployment drags out. One reason is why. Uh, prices are higher. So when unions raise the wage above equilibrium, the quantity demand of labor falls and unemployment results. Quote, unquote, insiders, workers who remain employed are better off. Quote, unquote, outsiders, workers who lose their jobs are worse off. Who determines that within a union? Okay, it's usually seniority. It's not based on productivity. So uh, perhaps not even the most efficient workers are getting the job. It's just the insiders versus the outsiders. That's pretty inefficient. 
some outsiders go to go on to become non-unionized labor. Uh, they join non-unionized labor markets, which increases labor supply and reduces the wages in those markets. So there's a little bit of tug of war going on. That's why usually union members do not like non-union members because they kind of upset the model. So are unions good or bad? Well, economists disagree. Critics say, well, unions are cartels. I typically call them a monopoly. They raise wages from above equilibrium, which causes unemployment and or depresses wages in non-union markets. Okay, they kind of screw up the market. You know how I feel about that. Advocates for unions say, well, unions counter the market power of large firms because they're pushing around their workers. We just push them back, which makes firms more responsive to workers' concerns. Okay, maybe there's a point there. All right. Generally speaking, large organizations, whether they're the firms or a large union, typically push people around and it doesn't it only thing it does is end up raising prices for consumers so just keep that in mind we're all consumers now the third thing that um, that we need to discuss here in terms of increasing structural unemployment is the efficiency wages the theory of efficiency wages is that firms voluntarily pay above equilibrium wages to boost worker productivity they want to pay people more so they're happy and happy workers are more productive now, different versions of efficiency wage theory suggest that different, there are different reasons why firms pay high wages. In the case of unions and minimum wage laws, the firms that pay above equilibrium wages do so involuntarily. Okay? They have to pay the minimum wage according to law, or they have to pay uh, the union workers higher because that's what the union workers demanded. The theory of efficiency wages, however, suggests that firms may be willing to pay extra high wages in order to increase productivity of their workers. Uh, I think this is something that Walmart's kind of coming around on. They've increased wages of their workers. Uh, they think that it make them happier. Uh, if they're happier, they're going to have less disputes. They get less disputes. That's lower costs. And if they're happier, they're going to be more productive and show up for work and things like that, which also lowers cost. Okay. Now, there's you know many companies have done this over the years. Uh, I think Apple's one of them. They usually pay above. Uh, market value for their workers just to make them happy and if you're happy you're working and if you're working you're productive and if you're productive they make more things they make more things they make more revenue uh, people are happy your costs are a little bit down despite the higher wages then profits are up profits are up that's a good thing for a company so there's a, such a thing as efficiency wages now there's four reasons why a firm may pay efficiency wages one is worker health um, in less developed countries, poor nutrition is a common problem. So paying a higher wage allows workers to eat better, makes them healthier and more productive, i.e. they're not sick all the time and they show up. Um, secondly, worker turnover. Hiring and training new workers is very costly to any organization. Paying higher wages gives workers more incentive to stay and reduces turnover. So you don't have to hire and train as many people. The first part is... It's not clearly relevant in rich countries like the U.S. with the worker health, where equilibrium wages for nearly all workers are way more than enough to provide for a worker's nutritional requirements. But in rich countries, but, but rich countries have a fairly small proportion of the world's population. So keep in mind, that's a big thing uh, worldwide. Secondly, the, the work you turn over. Um, besides the cost of placing ads, interviewing candidates, and training new hires, new workers are usually less productive in their first few months on the job. It takes, a, it takes time, sometimes a lot of time, to learn how to perform your duties efficient, efficiently. So for all these reasons, turnover is very costly to firms. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, the other two reasons why firms may, may pay efficiency wages. First, um, worker quality. Offering higher wages attracts better job applicants, which increases the quality of a firm's workforce. If a firm responded to a surplus in labor by reducing wages, the most com competent applicants may choose not to apply as they might have better opportunities elsewhere. What you want to be is be that better opportunity to attract the, uh, to attract the more qualified workforce. And then lastly, fourth, uh, worker effort. Workers can work hard or they can shirk. Shirkers are fired if caught. If, is being fired a good deterrent? Well, not, we don't know. Depends on how hard it is to find another job. If the market wage is above equilibrium wage, there aren't enough jobs to go around. So workers are, you know, because people want them. You know, if you're going to be paid a lot, people want your job. So if you shirk, man, somebody's there to replace you in a skinny minute. So if there aren't enough jobs to go around, you know, there's, the wage is higher. So workers have more incentive to work and not shirk. First of all, you're happier. So in the case you're not familiar with the efficiency wage theory, uh, here's, a, here's a Cliff's Notes version then. 
In many jobs, each worker can choose how hard he or she works. For simplicity, suppose that there are just two choices, working hard or shirking, uh, which is shirking is neglecting one's duties and responsibilities at work, hanging out on Facebook, doing those types of things. Clearly, the firm suffers when workers shirk. Output and hence revenue and profit are lower, so the firm fires, or fires workers caught shirking. However, monitoring a worker effort is costly and imperfect. Workers know there's a good chance they won't be caught if they shirk, so they shirk anyway. Paying workers an above average wage gives them an incentive to work hard rather than shirk, rather than shirk their responsibilities. If a firm is the only firm paying efficiency wages, then they stand if a firm is the only firm paying efficiency wages, then they stand to lose a particularly good job if caught shirking, because there's not a lot of jobs out there where firms overpay. If all firms are paying efficiency wages, then there will be structural unemployment due to the, due to the market wage being above its equilibrium level. Now, in this case, the incentive to work rather than shirk is the prospect of extended spell of unemployment. You know, if you lose your job, you don't want to lose it for a long time. Okay. This uh, line of reasoning is out of some studies by Shapiro and Stiglitz from 1984, the um, American Economic Review article entitled Equilibrium Unemployment as a Worker Discipline Device. Basically, if you know a job's really hard to, to get, if you lose your job, you're not going to shirk as much. So um, as, a, as an employer, if you pay higher wages, people are going to be much more likely to not want to lose their jobs. And if they're much more likely to not want to lose their jobs, they're going to work instead of shirk. Okay, So they're going to put forth a higher worker uh, ethic, worth or work ethic and effort. So let's apply these concepts. Which of the following would be most likely to reduce frictional unemployment? Remember, frictional. So think about that if you have to go back and look. Frictional. A, the government eliminates the minimum wage. B, the government increases unemployment insurance benefits. C, a new law bans labor unions. D, more workers post their resumes on LinkedIn.com and more employers use LinkedIn.com to find suitable workers to hire. And E, sectoral shifts become more frequent. Now, this will be a good exam question, each one of these. Answering it correct, correctly re requires the following knowledge and skills. First, knowing the definition of frictional unemployment and sectoral shifts. Knowing that the minimum wage laws and labor unions affect structural and not frictional unemployment. And knowing that unemployment insurance increases frictional unemployment. And being able to match policies and events uh, to the various causes of unemployment discussed in the preceding slides and in the textbook. So keep in mind that frictional unemployment that we're talking about here, that is the unemployment time that it takes, um, the, the percentage of folks that are looking for a job. So each one of these scenarios affects that differently. So let's take a look at a couple of which of the following oh my apologies uh, which of the following would be the most likely to reduce frictional unemployment? Well A and C. The government eliminates minimum wage and a new law bans labor unions. These are likely to reduce structural unemployment but not frictional. Okay, The question here is frictional. These are structural issues. Government eliminates the minimum wage. That's structural. New laws bans labor unions. That's structural. That changed the structure of the market, didn't it? The minimum wage and labor unions are two reasons why actual wage might be above equilibrium, which causes structural unemployment. It's not frictional unemployment. Now, let's take a look at B and E. Which of the following would be most likely, most likely to reduce frictional unemployment? Again, we're looking at frictional. Okay? And we're looking at reducing unemployment. Well, B and E... The government increases unemployment insurance benefits, and E, the sectoral shifts become more frequent. Both of these are likely to increase frictional unemployment, not reduce it. If the government re increases unemployment um, benefits, people are getting paid more to search for a job. They're incentivized to keep searching for a job, even if they potentially if they're going to find one. They're just incentivized to keep searching and not necessarily find one. Sectoral shifts become more frequent. That's the thing with the poor guy with the... Uh, Perhaps working at the textile mill and really needs to learn how to work at the BMW or the Boeing plant. Okay, he's getting kind of left behind by a sectoral shift. Those are going to increase your frictional unemployment. It's going to be a harder time for that cat to find a job. Now, again, looking which one of the following would be most likely to reduce frictional unemployment? All right, well, D, more workers post their resumes on LinkedIn.com and more employers use LinkedIn.com to find suitable workers to hire. 
This is likely to speed up the process of matching workers and jobs, which would reduce friction on employment. It is a medium for people to interact um, socially, even though it's online. It allows job seekers to meet um, job providers, and it lowers the hurdles, and it matches workers more quickly with jobs and reduces frictional unemployment. So a roundabout way there, we finally found the answer of how to reduce frictional unemployment. The big thing with this chapter, you got to know the difference between frictional and structural unemployment. Now, in summary, explaining the natural rate of unemployment, um, as a summary here, the natural rate of unemployment consists of frictional unemployment. It takes time to search for the right jobs, and um, it occurs even if there frictional unemployment occurs even if there are enough jobs to go around. It just takes time to get a job. Um, to search for a job, to get the job, do the paperwork and all that. All that's called frictional unemployment. Structural unemployment, conversely, is when a wage is above equilibrium, there's not enough jobs. Think about the minimum wage, okay? Due to minimum wage, labor unions, and efficiency wages, the equilibrium could be higher, uh, or excuse me, the wage could be higher than what it should be in equilibrium, and thus the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded. We have a surplus of workers looking for a job. That's structural unemployment. Now, in later chapters, we'll learn about cyclical unemployment, which are short-term fluctuations in unemployment associated with business cycles. Now, this last sentence, just a reminder to you, there will be more unemployment that will, than what's covered in this chapter. Our goal here has been to learn more about the natural rate of unemployment and the normal or average unemployment rate over the long run. So um, we'll study short-run fluctuations in later chapters. So, in summary... The unemployment rate is the percentage of those who would like to work um, who do not have jobs. Unemployment and the labor force participation vary widely across demographic groups. The natural rate of unemployment is the normal rate of unemployment around which the actual rate fluctuates. Cyclical unemployment is those deviations of unemployment from the natural rate and is connected to short-term economic fluctuations, which we'll talk more about in future chapters. The natural rate includes frictional unemployment and structural unemployment. Frictional unemployment occurs when workers take time to search for the right jobs. That's important. Frictional unemployment occurs when workers take time to search for the right jobs. Structural unemployment occurs when the ab above equilibrium wages result in a surplus of labor. Uh, things like efficiency wages, unions, and minimum wage laws. Three way, again, three reasons for above equilibrium wages that you need to know are minimum wage laws, unions, and efficiency wages. When wage is above what they should be in equilibrium, we have more labor quantity supplied than we have quantity demanded. They deviate from one another, and that excess of quantity supplied is a surplus, and that surplus of workers is people looking for jobs and can't find it. That's structural unemployment. Okay. So I hope this video has been helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm always available. Thank you.